Welcome back to the House of Gouldians. So in this particular episode, episode 9, we've got a breeder feature. We're going to be chatting to Valentine from Russia. I thought it'd be interesting to hear sort of how they do it in, in their sort of part of the world in terms of their Gouldian keeping. And then we're also going to uh, just have a catch-up session on where we are in terms of our preparation for the breeding season. So I hope you enjoy the show. So in terms of our own sort of bird room and our own preparation, you'll notice that behind me all the cages have been split. I've also done the deep clean in preparation for the breeding season. So what do I mean by that? I obviously take all the birds out, I split the cages, but then I scrub them out. I make sure that there's no residual dirt or, or mess. I then take a product uh, like a vet grade disinfectant and I spray down the cages to make sure that there's no sort of nasty bacteria or anything that's sort of lurking from um, the sort of maintenance period, if you like, and austerity period that's built up. Remember, we've had a whole bunch of birds in these particular flights. Yes, they've been separated by sex, so it was the hens up the top and the cocks in the middle and then chicks down the bottom. Uh, well, sorry, uh, chicks in the middle and cocks at the bottom. So the point is that they were all together. Now we're starting to split up. And I don't want a breeding pair that's going to be having newborn chicks now being exposed to sort of the bacteria from all the different birds. So that's why I, I sort of make sure I deep clean with a vet grade disinfectant. I then also scrub all the pigeon holes. Um, and what I like to do is I then take a little bit of an old product um, in this country, but it's called carpet dust. And I sprinkle that and then I actually sort of wipe it on with the dry cloth so that it spreads all over. Um, and that is a very good sort of bug repellent. So ants or mites or anything like that that comes into contact with the carbon dust is going to um, sort of perish. So it cuts down on the likelihood of us having those kinds of problems. I'm not saying it's the only control that I use. Obviously, you guys now do preventative treatments for mites and all that kind of thing. But I find that also just helps um, sort of keep the area sort of sanitary in terms of insects and that kind of stuff. So. You know, all of that stuff. You'll notice I then also, while I'm at it, I deep clean things like perches and feeders and drinkers and the nest boxes themselves get scrubbed. So it's really, really, when I say deep clean, I mean it. Um, I like to go into the breeding season fresh um, with everything 100% spotless. Um, and then I've, I've done all my pairings. Okay, so this particular episode, we're focusing on the breeding feature, uh, or breeder feature, should I say, with Valentine. Um, but in the next episode, I will be able to give you sort of the breakdown and the names for the new majestic birds and all that kind of thing, because all the pairings are basically done. Um, there's only one pair that doesn't have a nest box at the moment, and that's purely because I realized I'm one short, so I've ordered a replacement, and that was for a box that I had to discard um, it just wasn't suitable anymore, it was breaking and all the rest of it. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, things like the stress perches and that have been removed. Uh, normally, you know, I put stress perches in when there's a lot of birds in the cage. Um, but I do have a couple of small ones that I can put in if I see a pair isn't quite harmonious. There's maybe a bit of squabbling going on, that kind of thing. Just so that one partner can get away. What is interesting, and I wanted to talk about it purely because of the fact that it happens to everyone, is that you do have birds that will go into a late molt or a second molt. Um, it can happen. So what I found interesting is that the birds I've put out, which is mostly the white breast from last season, that I put out in uh, one of the flights outside, because of the change in the environment, even though they had molted during the molting season, I noticed that they're dropping feathers now. So. As a precaution, um, I've done a second sort of preventative treatment for mites just to make sure that there's nothing funny going on there because of wild birds and that kind of thing. Um, and obviously I made sure that things like calcium and iodine and all that kind of thing that affect the, ultimately affect the feather quality and that kind of thing is all in place. Um, but I'm assuming that it's purely because now it's gone from a fairly sort of um, mildly uh, mild room should I say in terms of temperature um, this room stays fairly cool even in the middle of summer when it's like 30 degrees outside it'll be about 22 23 in this room 
Whereas now they're in that outside flight, so they're exposed to the full heat of the day. And that adjustment has caused a second molt, essentially. So if you find yourself in a similar position, it's not something really to worry about. Obviously, the birds are now having a double sort of stress in terms of the molt. Um, they're going through it for a second time in a very short space of time. So make sure that your nutrients, your vitamins, all that kind of thing is as high as you can get them, just to help them through that process. Other than that, internally, the birds are all in sort of good condition. They're coming in, obviously, with the breeding season approaching. They're coming into breeding condition. So we'll go through the different pairs in detail, but like this hen, for example, her beak's completely black. Um, they just got their boxes like yesterday. Um, I have put some grass in this morning that they can start adding to the boxes and that kind of thing. So I fully expect that by the time episode 10 comes along, we'll probably have chicks in some of these boxes. Talking about chicks, um, I did mention in the previous episode that we had our first chick that we had run in the bird room. Um, that one's close to fledging, but it's not quite coming out the box yet. Uh, one of the other pairs that had laid um, a nice big clutch of eggs, there were seven eggs in the nest, but one was a foster. Unfortunately, those six eggs, four hatched, they were both a pair that I had been donated, uh, sorry, both birds were, were donated to um, us from Gerard, and they were both birds that didn't have rings on. So I don't know the age of them, they look like young birds, I suspect they're first years, and why I say that is the same thing that we found last year has happened again now with them, in that they hatched the chicks, they were brooding the hatchlings, but they weren't feeding them, which is an experience problem. And as a result, all four of those chicks, unfortunately, haven't made it. But they are, you know, they'll take a, a normal sort of natural break for a couple of weeks and then they'll try again as parents. And hopefully this time they would be successful. If I had known that they were definitely first kind of uh, year breeders, um, I would have probably paired them differently, maybe put them with a more experienced bird or ideally kept them one side for next year's breeding season. Um, but... It's one of those things, um, they've already paired up, they've bred, it's just now I need to be aware of the fact that they're not that experienced. So with all the boxes being on now, we'll do what we spoke about where we look at potentially fostering those eggs under a different pair, so at least I get their genetics this season. Um, and then I'll give them another chance to raise, but with another pair's exit. So that's kind of the plan, um, the sort of thinking to, to handle that. In terms of other pairs that are breeding, we've got a, a red-headed pair that the eggs are close to hatching. I can see that they're fertile, so I'm expecting those to hatch within the next two days. Um, so certainly by the time you see me again for the next episode, we will be able to report on them. Once again, it's a new pair in terms of the cock and hen pairing. So, you know, I don't know sort of how well they're going to do in terms of their first clutch. Hopefully they raise it without any problems. And they are second year breeders definitely, so there shouldn't be problems, but things can happen as we know with Gouldians. I always say to people, being a Gouldian keeper is kind of like a roller coaster ride. You know, you'll come into the bird room today, there's pairs that you've been trying to breed that have laid eggs and others have hatched babies and everything looks fantastic and it's, it's all sunshine and roses. And then the very next day you'll come into the bird room and the ones that hatched the chicks haven't fed them or they've chucked chicks or you realize that the eggs that you thought were going to be good are infertile and it's a roller coaster ride. If Gouldian finches were easy to breed, there wouldn't be a need for the type of channel. Um, and I think it's important as new breeders to, to Gouldians um, that you, you manage your expectations in terms of that so that you don't get discouraged. Um, it's a long-term sort of project. Um, and part of that sort of challenge of getting it right is what makes the hobby interesting. Certainly for me, that's the fact that I'm, in, I'm involved in the shows, so I enjoy the show bench side of things and that keeps my interest. And then obviously with Gouldians we've got the added benefits of all the different mutations and colours and that kind of thing. So there's definitely different challenges and interests to keep everyone sort of interested in the hobby. So yeah, um, enough of me talking now. Let's. Uh, get into the interview with Valentine. So 
from my side, a huge welcome to the channel. Um, I'm very interested in hearing what the Gouldian keeping is all about in Russia. Um, I must be honest, it's it's not sort of a part of the hobby that I've heard too much about in terms of what you guys are up to, how active you guys are in terms of shows and that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, maybe you want to give us a bit of your background and how you got into Gouldian keeping and that kind of thing. And then, yeah, we can take it from there. So from my side, a huge welcome to the channel. Um, I'm very interested in hearing what the Gouldian keeping is all about in Russia. Um, I must be honest, it's it's not sort of a part of the hobby that I've heard too much about in terms of what you guys are up to, how active you guys are in terms of shows and that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, maybe you want to give us a bit of your background, uh, how you got into Gouldian keeping and that kind of thing. And then, yeah, we can take it from there. Well, it was it was a sudden decision. Okay. So I I had uh, canneries, uh, Bengalis, and uh, just ordinary zebra finches when I was young uh, at the high school. So then I turned into dogs. Okay. And I was and I was breeding dogs for about about three hundred uh, three thirty years. Okay. Okay. So um with rather good success okay in this field but uh well suddenly i felt myself back to the birds okay again the first ones were bengalis then i turned into zebras um uh, yava sparrows but uh, i was just reading a lot about Gouldians, but I was frightened to uh, keep them because yeah. they turned, they seemed to me very fragile. So um, finally, I got the first two females from their uh, pet shop. Okay, they were they were in awful condition. Okay. Nevertheless, they lived uh, free last uh, happy years of their life in my home. Okay. So then I turned to the breeders. Then I turned to the community of the breeders. Then I uh, entered some uh, breeders uh, WhatsApp groups and so and so and so. And then I got finally some birds from Italy, okay. some birds from Ukraine, some, some birds from uh, Czech Republic. Okay. And finally, finally, now I have about 100 and a half Gouldians. Okay. And uh, tell me, is it sort of, sort of your focus within the Gouldians? Are you trying on any particular of the mutations or do you just keep sort of classic Gouldians or what's your sort of main interest? Well, the thing is that uh, it's a common thing for every Gouldian keeper, I think, um, that now, uh, first of all, you take the first Gouldian. Yes. It, it's, it, usually it's green one. Yes. Uh, then you want the bluebirds. Yes. Then you see uh, some new mutations. No matter how much it costs, you mm. must have it in your aviary. Yeah. Mm. So that's uh, because uh, uh, that's how I have uh, set in it now. Plenty of cinnamons, uh, of Bruno, uh, plenty of uh, Lutino, Albino, uh, Ivory, uh, but now I feel myself going back to the um, green ones and I'll explain. Uh, because uh, as I said, uh, I was breeding dogs, okay, and I do uh, know very well what is the construction of the dog, what is the type of the dog, yeah. what um, that um, a dog with a bad type will never win, no matter what you, uh, money you will spend on him, um, 
it's uh, the thing that you can't change with <laughs> grooming and so and so. Uh, the same thing turns with the Gouldians with me. I want to have big uh, size uh, birds okay. with a nice uh, model with nice type uh, because uh, when you look at this type of bird, it's very pleasant for an eye. Yes. Uh, if you look at very at a very very small, tiny, uh, long beak, flat head, uh, but it is uh, thirty-net. It doesn't uh, make your eyes hmm. happy. Okay. All right. So that's the thing. Now, well, I have I have mutations. I really will go on working with them, but. Now I will try to focus on uh, the typish birds. Yeah, for myself, I don't breed large numbers, um, but I breed very much for the show bench. So like your, yourself, my sort of focus is more around the type in that. Um, obviously, in South Africa, our type is quite different to sort of more Europe and Asia. Um, we tend to, our shape of the bird is very similar to the Australian sort of standard or type, if you like. Um, so it's a little bit different, whereas I know from what I've seen of the, the sort of models and that in Europe, they tend to be a little bit more robust, um, the birds. So, yeah, it's one of the questions that I had for you is sort of what standard or model are you guys sort of aiming for? What is your sort of show standard, if you like? So the thing is that in Russia, we don't have show standards. Okay. So we um, and we don't have shows. That's that's the thing, and that's the bad thing because um, we can't uh, compare our do uh, our birds. We can't see um, what is going on in uh, other aviaries. What's the um, uh, where the world is going on? So that that's the thing. Okay. And uh, there is no organization uh, here that uh, could uh, unit uh, all the breeders, for example, for Gouldian finches, like it is in um, United Kingdom. Mm. Um, so uh, it's on the one thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, four people from Russia they participated in the uh, first world online Gouldian show last okay. year and thanks to Ahmed uh, now we are preparing the same um, online show um, for Russian and Be uh, for Russia and Belarus. okay interesting it will be held it will be held in uh, November and uh, Ahmed will be the judge so uh, this will be the first uh, online show here in this country, and I hope it uh, will um, be annual thing, okay. maybe next year. And uh, this will help uh, people to uh, somehow uh, work in this field. Yes. Okay. So, so now I take it. There's a, obviously a group of you that have been active in that World Online Show in 2021. Mm -hmm. So have you got sort of a, a club? I know you said there's no sort of overriding association that has a standard and that kind of thing, but is there a bit of a club no. going or, no. or what is the scenario? No, no, no. Okay. Just uh, separate breeders. Okay. All right. But you've linked up obviously through sort of various platforms. So you at least know about each other and you can organize this show that you're doing in November. Uh, the group in the, uh, the chat and uh, WhatsApp. Okay. That's All right. the main uh, thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And tell me, in terms of the actual keeping of Gouldians sort of in your sort of climate and that kind of thing, I, I know Russia can get very cold in the winter and that. Um, are you guys mostly keeping birds indoors or do you have aviaries for the Indoor. summer or indoors okay. mostly indoors uh i th think that only in uh very south regions okay they can keep it uh, late in autumn maybe 
Okay. But uh, even um, in these regions, they will have they can have snow in winter, so it's be it's better to keep them indoors all the day all the year round. Okay, so you're breeding indoors, and then how do you sort of control? your sort of breeding season. So what brings your birds into condition then if you, I assume it's temperature controlled the room or what is the scenario? Well, as uh, I'm not able to uh, tell you about the other aviaries. Okay. Well, many of them just take the birds and put it into their uh, breeding cage and that's all. Okay. So uh, I was following the same uh, for about maybe three years. Okay. Um, with some faults and so and so. Now I this is my first breeding season, when I prepared uh, birds according to their uh, life cycles. Okay. And now my birds are ready for the breeding cages okay. next week. Okay. So you starting them, all of them. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I will uh, this this uh, season I will breed um, half of the aviary will go to the breeding cages. Another one will go for the uh, rest. Okay, interesting. So you've gone through the cycle now to obviously prepare them properly. So I assume by that you mean you've sort of changed their diets as uh, the seasons yes. progressed yeah. and you've put them yeah. through austerity yeah. and that kind of thing. Okay, no, interesting. And sort of your sort of soft food and that that you're using now to get them into condition is the sort of what's the typical sort of ingredients that you're using at the moment? You mean the corn or you mean the soft? Uh, oh, the soft food, food that you, you're giving them, yeah. Well, soft food, I give them uh, a German one. No okay. idea what's the name of the food, but it's... Okay. Uh, Yes. Okay, so obviously it, a high in protein and that kind of thing. And then are you sprouting seed and that kind of thing to sort of help get the birds into condition for the breeding season? Or sort of what are you... Well, uh, the thing is that they had uh, the uh, dry season Okay. Uh, for about a month uh, with uh, three types of uh, uh, corn uh, of seeds. Okay. Um, now they have a very rich one. Okay. Can I really can't uh, just name you all the ingredients? Okay. I will not remember them in English yeah. at all. That's fine. I can I can send you it uh, later on. No, I'm I'm just so. I'm just curious because you know in, in South Africa, for example, our kind of seasons are controlled by our weather because our birds aren't sort of in heated rooms that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, we still go through the changes in diet. So, for example, um, now in the maintenance period, we'll drop to mostly a seed diet with very little sort of protein and egg food. And then mm -hmm. they go through the austerity, which is basically uh, we put them on red manna or uh, white millet mix only. Uh, yeah. So they won't get any soft food. And then in the, the sort of lead up to the breeding season and during the breeding season, the guys sort of go all out. So they're giving sprouted seed and they're giving, you know, everything that the, the guys have heard that will work type thing, they kind of build up. So each breeder's got their different sort of mix and the different way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So I was just sort of curious because you're more reliant on what you're feeding opposed to the weather because they're indoors, um, sort of what that difference was. Okay, so you are sort of, obviously going through very sort of different diets during the year and that's how you're getting it right okay no interesting yeah, yeah. and then sort of preventative wise do you guys find you need to because you're mostly indoors are you having to do a lot of preventative medicine for mites and all that kind of thing or is it not really an issue well i think that uh in my ivory i usually use uh s76 uh, okay uh uh every month uh for two days okay then once uh half a year i uh, before their uh nest season i use by cox for uh preventing coccidias okay okay uh what else what else uh some uh acids um 
like I think that they are the same um, with uh, vinegar or something like that. Oh, uh, the apple cider vinegar. Okay, with you. Yeah. With you. Yes. Yeah. About uh, once a week. Uh, well, that's all I think. Okay. Uh, just curious, because, yeah, once again, it seems to be where there's quite big differences. So some parts of the world, they, the guys seem to do a lot more preventative medicine, and they're giving sort of even going to the extent of antibiotics and that kind of thing, which there's a lot of debate about. Whereas I know South Africa, it's something that we're trying to steer away from, where the guys do the stuff that you're referring to, where it's mites and deworming and Baycox for coccidia and that kind of thing. But other than that, we try to discourage the guys from doing using antibiotics because obviously that can be negative in the long term. Um, so I was, I was curious sort of how you guys are sort of going about that side of, of things as well. So we've discussed sort of your, your environment and that kind of thing. For the show, though, that you're doing, um, how is, is Ahmed going to base it on the NBVV standard or, or what yes, is it going to be? Yes, yes. Okay. So you guys are basically going to follow that for this show. You're going to be doing the NBVV. Yeah. Okay. No, interesting. Interesting. And yeah, um, from my side, it's it, it's just interesting to sort of get other people's perspectives and sort of ways of doing things and where each country is in the hobby. Because I think it's something that has the ability to unite people. And I found for us, the World Online Show was great because in South Africa, we're quite isolated in terms of being able to, we can't really take birds across the border to go and show them and come back and that kind of thing. We're in the same situation. So yeah, it's, it's just interesting to chat to guys like yourself, who's sort of, you know, you how you found that platform. So I take it it was quite different for you to be able to participate against the rest of, of the guys. That was, that was really fantastic. Because, um, well, as I was breeding dogs and I was showing dogs, it's a very usual um, world for me. Okay. So I like shows, I like exhibiting uh, um, pets. So, and uh, well, I was at the moment uh, where I was, well, I had many birds. Some okay. of them are good, some of them I think not very uh, close to the standard, okay. but um, I wanted uh, an eye from the side to yes. tell me what my birds are can be qualified. Okay. So, uh, and according to that uh, um, experience, I could uh, make the breeding program more. Uh, show oriented maybe okay in the future so and um well it helped me a lot um uh, and uh this year all the people from uh, who participated in the world dog show they okay. were the first people who said that we will participate in our local show because they really liked their uh, uh ty uh, the type of the show because mm. it's very convenient you just film the dog uh, film the birds yes yes and uh just uh, there is no need to travel there is no need to pay for the hotel and and so and so yes um okay. so and they got and they got rather good results because uh two cinnamon uh hands from uh St. Petersburg they took their first and the second places in the class so that was really great oh, fantastic okay and yeah. how many guys are there sort of in that you're aware of that are partaking in the show now in November well good question uh I think there will be about 15, maybe 20. Okay. Maybe less, maybe more. But okay. it's uh, it, it's okay if there will be 15. Okay. Um, I mean, that's, that's a great number. I mean, especially considering it's the sort of first local show you're doing, if you like. Um, as a starting point, it's yeah. actually fantastic. So, yeah. Um, you know, our shows in South yeah. Africa, we typically... 
you're talking probably between 15 to 20 on average Gouldian keepers that will put on the show bench. There's a lot more Gouldian keepers out there, but very few of them are on the show side of things. Let's put it that way. Uh, yes, the same the same things here. Many, many people say, what what's the use of this show? We don't need it. For me, for me, it's about, like you mentioned earlier, is if you're not putting your birds on the show bench, it's difficult to sort of judge for yourself how your quality is doing. Are you improving? Are you... So, you know, it's one thing to breed the different colors, <coughs> but the colors only take you so far with the bird. It, you want that quality. You want that, that sort of look and that kind of thing. So for me, that's what yeah. keeps my yeah. interest. I love the show bench. I love taking part in the shows and all that kind of thing. Um, but obviously it's not for everyone, and we understand that. Yes, yes, right you are. Because yeah. there are fans for their big uh, mm model birds and there are fans for the smaller birds and they say that our birds are fat okay. they're uh, not, they are not Gouldians at all and so and so the same uh, thing with Badgerigas because uh, mm. the show birds uh, there looks quite different from the uh, normal ones yeah I must be honest our Standard because it's closer to the Australian one um, compared to the European. There's a big difference um, And like you say, you know f for many of our keepers They look at the European one and they say I know the birds fat and that kind of thing But for me when I was discussing it with Ahmed What we found amazing was that how many similarities there are between our Show standard and the international show standard. So yes, the shape of the bird is different but in terms of the color, which is the most important part of the bird, in terms of the markings, in terms of position on perch, size, all that kind of thing, we were so, <coughs> sorry, we were very, very close. So now it was interesting chatting to him the other day and, and going into the detail on that. Um, and yeah, it's mm -hmm. just, it's great to sort of get different perspectives in terms of the bird and that. So for me, I don't find... Looking at other standards, a problem. I, I find it encouraging to see those similarities and, and decide from there where we can go and where we can improve and improve on our own sort of show standard and that kind of thing. So, yes, yes. Uh, and, sort sure. of, and sort of how many birds are you hoping to see on the show? Is there sort of a limited number per person or so, what? Yeah. Yes, there was uh, the limits for every owner to uh, show no more than 10 birds. Okay. Well, some of them will uh, are planning to uh, show one or two, so uh, some of them will show ten. Okay. And so it will be maybe approximately no more than one hundred birds. Okay. But I mean that's a great start for a, a local show. I mean that's that's fantastic. Yeah, we blessed in that we do have the physical shows as well. Um, and typically those shows will range from about 40, 50 birds up to about 200 max. So we're not like Europe where there's a thousand or 2000 birds on the show bench, um, but they decent size shows and it's always a good day to, you know, to go out and see the birds and that kind of thing. But we've started doing for our club, we've started doing the virtual shows that you're going to be doing now. Um, mm -hmm. And we also do a, what we call a hybrid show. So the guys that are close by that can come and put their birds on the sh on the show bench, that's fantastic. But then our sort of members further afield that can't come because it's too far to travel or too expensive, they can enter via mm -hmm. the videos. Um, and yes. what we do is on the show bench, we've got the, the birds as they come up, but then next to it, we've got a, a computer screen. And if there's a virtual entry, then we call up that video and then the judge can look at both. And we tried that last year for two of our shows and it actually worked very, very nicely. So, yeah, it's, it's something to, to think about and, and yeah, who knows what the future holds, eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting, really interesting. And, uh, well, this type of shows, I think, will go on uh, developing because... Um, People now are really pressed of time, yes. so they and they don't want to go somewhere 
about two or three thousand kilometers to show their bird well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it saves it, it saves many things: uh, yes. money, time, uh, what else? Yeah. Birds. Yeah. So, but I mean, you you talk like that. It's so hugely stressful for the birds to travel. You know, it's fine if they're just going down the road, but with them, when you're taking them a thousand kilometers or two, three thousand, like you're talking yeah. about, then you suddenly start losing birds on the way because it's a two, three day trip or you're flying. And that's, yeah. So now I can understand where you're coming from. And yeah, I wish you guys all the best for that virtual show. I'd love to see some of the, the sort of you. photos. From I will I will keep you in the I will keep you with all the information about it. I would love to if you could send that to me and then also sort of any pictures and or video um that I'd love to see the birds okay. and see how it was. But yeah, it's been great chatting and um I wish you guys all the best obviously both with the things that are happening but also for the show that's coming up. Um I hope that it goes really nicely. Thank you so much. So yeah. So I was really glad to chat with you too. Thanks, Valentine, and all the best. Have a Thank good you. Evening. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Right, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I found it quite interesting to chat to him in terms of the sort of, um, we can see some common patterns starting to sh develop or come through, listening to Javier a couple of episodes ago, now listening to Valentine in terms of the way they're bringing birds into condition in temperature control environments. So they're doing, both of them, using food basically um, and diet to bring the birds into condition for the breeding season. So if you're in a colder climate environment and you, you're keeping birds in a temperature controlled environment, you have now picked up those tips and, and you know sort of how to go about it for your area. And that's part of the benefit of talking to guys from all over the world. Um, it was always the idea of this channel to be for the whole sort of birding, the Gulgian birding community, not just for South Africans. Um, and, you know, I can't, I don't have that sort of experience in terms of that type of climate breeding. So it's very interesting to chat to guys from all over the world. So I really hope you enjoyed that. I think it was also interesting to sort of hear where Russia is in terms of their sort of Gulgian community and how they're sort of coming together. Um, I do realize for those of you that are sort of um, sort of following the politics and that, that it may have been a bit of a controversial episode, but from my side, this channel is not about politics, it's not about religion, it's not about any of that, it's about the bird. So please sort of look at it from that perspective um, and let's sort of steer clear of, of what's going on in the world, sort of politics side of things. Um, and then in terms of the final point, um, you know, I thought we would take a look at that show. So obviously, when that episode was filmed, um, that conversation with Valentine, it was sort of late October last year. Uh, we now sort of well into the towards the end of January um, in 2023. So, you know, obviously the show has already happened in terms of that November show. I plan to have a bit of a follow up with Valentine, um, maybe in a, another month or so's time, and we can just chat to him and see how that show actually went. Um, and sort of go into a bit more detail on the individual birds. Maybe we can also look at getting Ahmed uh, to sort of give us some feedback on, on the birds and that kind of thing and, and sort of show us or discuss from a South African judge perspective as myself and Ahmed from his perspective um, as an MBV judge and obviously the judge that actually judged the show. And we can sort of discuss the sort of pros and cons of the birds from our different perspectives. Um, and I think uh, he doesn't know it yet, but I think that would actually be a great show to sort of have. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll sort of work on something along those lines where maybe it's a three-way discussion with Valentine, myself and him. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so that, that's for a, a future episode, if you like. But I hope you enjoyed today's show and I hope you got some benefits out of it. And I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time.